Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We praise your name because you have called us, you have equipped us, and you have sent us to do something definite for your name. We pray that, Lord, we will not disappoint you in Jesus' name. We are praying that tonight as we look at your word, that will speak to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Impress these words upon our hearts. Make us the people we ought to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight I want to speak to you on the peril of silent faith. The peril of of silent saints. In First Corinthians chapter nine, verse sixteen. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, the peril of silent saints, woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, it is the responsibility of every believer. That means every brother, every sister that names the name of Christ that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and through that faith in Christ he has been born again. It is the responsibility of such a one to evangelize, to preach the gospel to those who have not been saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You will notice in that verse 18, the word us appears twice. First, it says, he has reconciled us to himself. We are born again. We are called by the name of the Lord. We are no more enemies of God, enemies of Christ. We have been reconciled unto him, therefore we are related to him. We are now in fellowship with him. Then you see in that same verse 18, he has given to us the same us. Everyone that is born again fits into this. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 19, to which that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us. You see that again? As many of as many of us as have been reconciled unto God, as many of us as have been born again, verse 18 says, He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says, He has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's name, be you reconciled unto God. He has told us both in verses 18 and 19 that we have the ministry as well as the word of reconciliation. Now in verse 20, he outlines our responsibility that we have become ambassadors for Christ and we should be telling the world around us, be ye reconciled unto God. The gospel has been committed to the hands of everyone in the church to preach to everyone outside the church. There is a link between those inside with those outside. Those outside are blind. Those inside are begun to see. Those outside are unsaved. 
Those inside have been saved. Those outside are enemies, strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. Those inside are the children of God. And they are partakers of the heavenly calling. And the ministry of those inside the church is that they will reach to those outside the church. Those in Christ are to preach to those outside Christ. Some neglect the greater ministry outside the church because of their limited ministry inside the church. Here we are today. Many of us have some ministry inside the church. But it's a limited ministry. It's a very small ministry we have within the church. But then we have focused all our attention on our ministry, limited ministry inside the church, to the point that we have neglected our ministry, which is the greater ministry outside the church. We have many people outside the church that the ministry of reconciliation has been committed into our hands. The word of reconciliation has been given to us so we can give to those people outside and tell those multitudes in their thousands and millions, be ye reconciled unto God, but our limited ministry in the church is hindering us from fulfilling our greater or limited ministry outside the church. And the condemnation of those who neglect the greater ministry outside will be very, very great. The Lord wants us to understand like, that like our quiet time is not an occasional thing. It's a daily, regular, frequent thing. Our personal devotional life, prayer life, is not an occasional thing. It's a daily, frequent thing that we must do always. Our Bible reading is not an occasional thing. It's something daily and frequent. In the same way, personal evangelism is not an occasional program for a person who has received the ministry of reconciliation. It is a daily, a daily lifestyle of obedience to the Lord. And every believer must be a witness, a daily witness. There is no excuse for not serving God daily as a witness. Let's look at that passage again. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Here, Paul the Apostle was not referring to his ministry inside the church. He was referring to his ministry outside the church. Now you will see that as you read on in verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Very late that I, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews outside the church, I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews into the church. To them that are under the law outside the church, as under the law, that I may gain them that are under the law and bring them into the church. To them that are without the law outside the church, as without law, not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I may gain them, win them into the church, into Christ, that are without the law. And you see that he was talking about his ministry outside the church, that he needed to reach out to the people. And he said, Woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. In the same way, every believer needs to understand, necessity is laid upon you to preach, to the unconverted. 
in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Therefore, thou gird up thy loins and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. Here God himself told Jeremiah, and he said, you must be very careful that to fulfill the ministry I've laid upon you. If you don't, I will confound you before the people. There is the temptation to be silent because of a number of reasons. And Jeremiah had that temptation, that he could have been silent, the reason he could have been silent, he gave in this chapter, in chapter 1, verse 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Here Jeremiah wanted to leave the ministry that God had placed upon his life. His complaint is that he was ignorant. He was weak. He was unlearned. He was childish and immature. And therefore he could not possibly do all that God wanted him to do. As God said, he had sent him unto the nations. Verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I set thee apart, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And you see here that Jeremiah had ministry inside his own nation, the nation of Israel. But again, he had ministry outside his own nation, outside Israel. And God said, I have ordained you a prophet unto the nations. There is a ministry inside your nation here. There is a ministry outside the nation and you must not sacrifice one for the other and when Jeremiah saw the greatness, the weight of that, that type of ministry he said, ah Lord God behold, I cannot speak for I am a child and God will not take any excuse from any of us there are a number of us that are saying we're not educated enough. We're just as educated as a little child. God says, I won't take that from you. A dispensation of the gospel is laid upon you. Woe is unto you if you preach not the gospel. Other people will say, I am not God. I am a child. I have the foolishness of a child. I'm not wise. I blow it every time I try to speak. I make a lot of mistakes. God says, he didn't take that from Jeremiah. He's not going to take that from you. That even though you say you are a child, you are not learned, you are foolish, you are ignorant, you are not educated, he still says, gather up thy loins and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. And he says, be not afraid. Be not dismayed at their faces. If you are, I will confound you before them. The question is, what are the things that make people to want to keep quiet? Already I've told you some. The idea or the feeling that you are just a child. As ignorant as a child. As weak as a child. As immature as a child. But there are other reasons we find in Jeremiah chapter 20. Verse 7. O Lord, Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Maybe you are surprised at what Jeremiah is saying, talking about God. Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. What he meant is this. When God called him, he didn't know that there will be any difficulty as much as he saw. He didn't know that persecution will come. 
He thought the ministry of the prophet will be a great ministry, an interesting ministry, that any time he rose up and he spoke in the name of the Lord to sinners, to backsliders, and to those in the outside nations, he thought immediately they would not accept. And he wouldn't have to preach twice to one person. Once he spoke the word, they would just accept. That was the impression with which he went into the ministry. But now, when he got into that ministry, he saw that sometimes he spoke once, they didn't accept. And yet, he had to speak the second time. And he said, Lord, I've been deceived. I thought it would be easy. I thought it would be a bed of roses. I thought that every day I will just have my combat very easy. I thought that I'll be so highly respected as a prophet of God. But then he says, what have I found out? I found out that I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. You may discover that as you are preaching the gospel to the sinners. That they will mock you. They will make jest of the Christian faith. They will not immediately say, yes, I'm going to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that derision, because of that mocking, the temptation may be for you to become silent. Remember, there is danger, there is peril for the silent sage. Verse 8, for since I speak, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then he, he said, he spoke to the people that were violent, that they should repent, they should turn to the Lord, they should bury all their evil practices. He thought they would say, that's reasonable. He thought they would say, yes, we accept, we're going to repent. But he said, instead of repenting immediately, they began to reproach him. Verse 9, then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. You see that danger? When you are preaching to those sinners outside, and you have told them they ought to repent, they should give their lives to the Lord, the danger is if they do not repent immediately, if they do not surrender immediately, if they do not give their lives to the Lord immediately, or if their lives are not transformed immediately, the danger is for you to get discouraged. The temptation is for you to keep quiet. But remember, if you keep quiet, there is danger behind you. Remember, if you keep quiet, there is a peril following after you. Woe is unto you. If you preach not the gospel, verse 9, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. Let's see another danger or temptation of keeping quiet. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, from verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold the prayer. And as seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive a sign. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Do you see why some people are tempted to keep quiet in their places of work? Is that they feel that their work may be threatened if they evangelize, if they preach the gospel. Over here, Ananias was having the fear that he might lose his life. It was the fear of persecution that made him to want to keep quiet. And he was telling the Lord, 
I cannot do that. I cannot preach the gospel. So a man like Saul, I have heard so much about him. That's the reason some people will not be able to intelligently, prayerfully give the gospel to their manager or to their boss. They never even pray, pray about it. They never even consider it. They say, that man, I know what he does. I know what he says. He doesn't want anything to do with the gospel. And if I go to preach the gospel to him, I might lose my job. I might lose my life. I might lose my livelihood. And because of that, they will not preach. But remember, woe unto you if you preach not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like we learned last week on the responsibility and the ministry of a watchman. That God has made you a watchman over those people that you are working together with. And if you don't preach unto them, there is danger. And you can see it very clearly in the word of God. Woe unto that saint. Woe unto that brother. Woe unto that sister. Who will remain silent because of the fear of persecution. That's what the Bible says. The peril of silent saints. And so Ananias was fearing persecution. And because of that, he didn't want to preach the gospel. There may be some of us who are fearing to talk to our neighbors. Because we've seen those neighbors, once in a while when they get drunk, once in a while when they get out of their senses, they can fight anyone. And they can destroy so much. And the Lord is telling you, don't let him die in his violence and fighting like that. Preach the gospel to him. You say, Lord, am I qualified to do that? Yes, you are. It's the same reason why some people refuse to give the gospel to their husband. Because they see that that husband, they say, am I even coming to church? Am I being a worker? I'm just uh, enduring a lot. Oh yes, you are enduring a lot. And yet the Lord has made you the evangelist to that husband. Am I supposed to preach the gospel to him too? Oh yes. After much prayer, after asking the Lord for the wisdom, after asking the Lord for the appropriate time, after asking the Lord for the way you ought to present that gospel, you are to present the gospel to your husband. This is some reason why some people don't present the gospel to their wives. They say, well, already my wife is just showing me that she is not in line and she doesn't accept this gospel. And she's behaving in such a way that I will know that she doesn't want anything of the gospel. And yet you are the evangelist in that family, in the home. Because God has given you the gospel so that that person outside the church, outside Christ, but in your home, will hear the gospel. Am I supposed to preach the gospel to my unbelieving wife too? Oh yes. And for your schoolmates too. And for the teachers that are teaching along with you. Oh, you say, but she always say, uh, reject whenever I want to say, can I talk to you? She'll say, no, I'm sorry. Yes, make another attempt. And you are supposed to preach the gospel to the headmaster as well. But she, he always says, he has no time for that. Make another attempt. And in the market, when you go to buy food stores, you women, you are supposed to present the gospel to those you meet in the market. Am I supposed to do that? Oh, yes. You have a ministry to those outside the church, outside Christ. You, you see other people, they also do not evangelize because of another problem they have. Let's see in Acts chapter 15. Verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. You know why some people do not uh, evangelize? They are strongly committed to personal, private opinion. They are not willing to let go. And because of such commitment to personal, private opinion, they spend all their energy in argument, all their energy in contention, all their energy in saying, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with that. 
just let us uh, spend all our energy on something we don't agree with. Don't be so committed to personal, private opinion that your ministry of reconciliation to the outside world will be so neglected. You know, my brother, my sister, if you have a personal opinion you are committed to, if you are not careful, at your spare moment, you'll be thinking about that personal opinion every time. People are not going along with me. People don't agree with me. And I have the best idea. I have the whole thing, the whole strategy for what that zone ought to do, what the district ought to do. And those coordinators and zonal leaders, they are not listening to me. You'll be so committed to that personal, private opinion that even without seeing that coordinator, you'll be getting angry. And every time you remember that coordinator or that zonal leader, anger will fill your heart. It's a sign you have a strong commitment to personal, private opinion. Shift that private uh, um, determination. Shift it on the work of God. Do not be committed to any opinion. Opinions come and go. Be committed to personal evangelism. And whatever is happening, well, all that you are being committed to, that's uh, something that is very limited. I told you, our ministry within the church is limited. Why is Paul the greater ministry outside the church? Because you are so angry. Because you are so unhappy. The way they are dealing with that uh, problem, the problem of that sister in our zone, I don't agree with that. Maybe you are right, but don't be committed to that personal opinion. So the point that your ministry of reconciliation is in that, a man that is getting angry every time at what is going on, his mind will be blurred. His head will be blurred. He will not see very clearly. In fact, if he's not very careful, all his anger will become like smoke before his eyes, like dust, like cloud before his eyes. He will not be able to see into the future. Do not be so committed to anything. Anything. Just be committed to the work that God has given you to do. That's evangelism. The people outside are perishing. But you see Barnabas, he was so committed to private, personal opinion. And Paul the Apostle said, Barnabas, this isn't right. And a sharp contention began. For his right. That's not the important thing. Paul might have been wrong. Barnabas might have been wrong. But once an issue will conflict with the ministry of reconciliation for which God will judge you on the last day, drop that issue. Once that conflict has arisen, and you see that that conflict, that contention, that argument is going to disturb the ministry of reconciliation that God has placed in your hand, please drop that thing. That's what Barnabas should have done. But he allowed a sharp contention. He allowed his strong, personal, private opinion to affect the ministry of reconciliation that God had given him. Remember how the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have committed into them. And God took them from inside the church, and he sent them outside the church. He moved them out of the limited ministry inside the church to the great unlimited ministry outside the church. And Paul called him and said, this greater ministry outside, let's, see, let's go and see how it is doing. Let's go and see how to make the fire to burn hotter and the light should to shine brighter. And he said, yes, we'll go, but my personal opinion has to go with me. I'm now strong-headed on this matter. I'm hard on this matter. I'm committed to this private opinion, Paul, that if you do not allow this personal opinion to travel with me, I'm not going to continue that ministry of reconciliation. And Paul said, you cannot be committed to the personal opinion without being separated from the Lord and the ministry. Let's, let's be very careful that we don't allow ourselves to fall into the temptation of being so committed to this personal, private, selfish thing. Well, there are other people that they lose the ministry that God has given unto them just by sheer laziness. Because they are slothful. They are not willing to arise and do something. And yet, what are the dangers 
in being silent. Let's go back to that first Corinthians again. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. There is great danger in silence. When God has commanded you to preach the gospel to the unsaved, great danger in keeping quiet. When God has commanded and commissioned you to preach the gospel to the unsaved, what are the dangers? Let's see them one by one. Let's go back to Jeremiah again. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto all and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces. That is, do not keep quiet because their faces are hard. Because their attitudes are repulsive. Do not keep quiet because they seem resistant to the gospel. If you keep quiet, I will confound thee before them. What does it mean to confound? To confound means to overthrow. God said, Jeremiah, if you keep quiet, if you are silent, I will confound you. I will overthrow you. It also means to be defeated. It means, Jeremiah, if you keep quiet, you'll experience defeat every area of your life and not be the captain that goes before you anymore. The word confound also means to confuse. That means Jeremiah now will live his life in confusion. It also means to throw into disorder. And it means to perplex. It means to curse. You see what God was telling Jeremiah? God was telling Jeremiah that this was the ministry I had called him to. The ministry of preaching or giving the word that God will give him to the nations outside Israel. And also to Israel as well. God has given you a ministry within and a ministry without. The ministry you have within is limited. The ministry you have without, that is outside the church, is unlimited and it is great. It's very, very wide. The one you have within the church, you are doing? Well, you are doing it because you have a lot of coordinators and zonal leaders that are supervising, that are pushing you on, that are encouraging you, that are helping you, that are taking the reports every time. But then this other one, that probably only the Holy Ghost is supervising it. Probably only your conscience is reminding you. But it appears you do the one that a human coordinator, a human zonal leader is supervising more than the one that the Holy Ghost and your conscience are supervising. For you, the supervision of the Holy Ghost is not as important and it is not as effective as the supervision of a man which shows your level of understanding, which shows the place you put the Holy Ghost in your life, that the Holy Ghost every time is saying, the Father has commissioned you. The Son has commissioned you. And I'm here in your life. I'm here in your heart to spur you on, stir you on, so that you will handle this ministry outside the church. And you can silence the Holy Ghost. And which means that when you silence Him like that, and you do not respond to His supervision in your life, you grieve the Holy Ghost. And it says, when you do that and you are silent, you will be confounded. Which means you will be overthrown. There will be defeat in your life. There will be confusion in your life. A lot of things will be thrown into disorder. And brothers and sisters, let's check up in our lives. Aren't you confused many times? Disorder a lot of times? Aren't you having some overthrow in your life a lot of times? Sometimes you are so perplexed. 
that you are wondering what's the matter. That's what God said. That's the danger of keeping quiet. It's the peril of silent saying. Point number two. Part of the danger of silent saying is in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. Whoso suppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. That means the danger for the silent saint is that he will experience many unanswered prayers in the most perplexing circumstances. The desire of every child of God is that, Lord, when I come to a perplexing situation, when I come to situations where my resources and all my energy will not be able to carry me through, Lord, I'll be calling on you, please answer me. And God says, I will answer you, provided the ministry of reconciliation I've given you to call the people that are crying for help, crying for salvation, crying for redemption, outside, provided you take that ministry very seriously and you go to them and you preach the gospel to them. But if you don't, and you stop your ears at the cry of the poor, at the people that do not know the way of redemption, and they are crying, saying, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And I place you on the earth so that you can have a ministry of reconciliation towards them. If you stop your ears at their cry, you also will cry in your most perplexing situation, and I will not answer. You see what we do against ourselves by being silent? And yet you could have taken just about 10, 15 minutes to talk to that neighbor. Yet you could have taken just a break time in the lunch hour to talk to that co-worker. Yet during that time of um, in the bus or riding in the bus, you could have spoken to that person sitting by your side and God will know that you are not stopping your ears at the cry of the poor, you could have taken just five minutes to tell that person selling Gary to you in the market and tell her about Jesus, about Christ, about salvation. And then your prayers could have been answered fast. But because you are being silent, now you are suffering under the peril of silent saints. That in the most perplexing situations in your life, you are not able to get your prayers through. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 26. He that withholdeth corn, the bread of life, the people shall curse him. But blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth age. The curse from the perishing on earth and in hell will come upon the people that have the corn, the bread of life, and they do not give it. And when the Bible says this, what the Bible is saying is that the curse will attach itself on this man. I, I don't know whether you have studied curses in the Bible. There are some curses that God himself will ward off from people. Like when Balaam tried to curse the children of Israel. They had not done anything that would make a curse come upon them. And so God said, I turned the curse into a blessing. But then here it is written, He that withholdeth the corn. It says, The people shall curse him. And if it is true for the natural, for the earthly, physical bread that people eat, how much more for the bread of life? That we have it, we're hurting it, we're hiding it, and we do not allow the people that are perishing for hunger, for the bread of life, to hear the word of life. And God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And Christ says, I've committed that ministry into their hands. If you don't, the people, you tell me, when somebody dies, and he goes to hell, and in hell, don't you know how that rich man spoke in hell? And said to St. Lazarus, that he might dip his finger in water when somebody gets to hell like that and he remembers that in the same house I'm living, 
His zonal leader has been there, a preacher of the gospel. And that zonal leader knows much of the Bible on salvation, on repentance, on faith in Christ, on sanctification, even knows much more than the sinner needs. And that zonal leader never opened his mouth. A trained preacher, an equipped preacher, and a person that has been given the Holy Ghost and has the position of a zonal leader in a church like this and can teach such the scripture and can even help other people counseling. But then that person living in the same house, the person dies in sin. And the fellow in hellfire realize that if that man had taken just 30 minutes a week to have spoken the gospel to me, I might not have been here. What a curse that person can rain on that fellow. When you realize that a person working, maybe a manager, maybe a director in a place of work, and the people over there, they know him to be a Christian, but he never bothers anybody with his Christianity. He never tells them how they ought to be born again if they die and go to hell. When they come to realize that that person maybe had been sent out to even go outside Nigeria, so it may be for a week or for two weeks, to go and preach the gospel to other people, and now they work in the same office, they go to hell. When they realize, what? So we had somebody with us who could travel outside Nigeria to be preaching the gospel, and those of us that were working with him, he never told us how to escape hell, what a curse they will put on that fellow. When you think about it, that primary school teachers who are here, who are born again, and they know how easily those children could have been born again, if they are taking time to talk to them, if they are taking time to plead with them, if those children eventually get to hell, when those children realize in hell, we are the teachers who could have easily spent some time with us to give us the gospel. What a curse they will bring upon such a fellow. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him on earth and also in hell. Those are the perils, those are the dangers awaiting silent saints. Not only that judgment from God. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 11 and 12. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and thou and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, does he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his work? Shall he not render to every man according to his work? That means that there will be judgment upon such an individual as well. Jeremiah chapter 20. Verse 9 again. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing. There are many times that believers don't know why they have this feeling of Pressure in the heart, in the mind, and depression, and unrest, and heat within. Sorrow covers them all over. It covers their mind, covers their heart, covers their brain, to the point of serious depression. And they say they don't know why. They become moody. They become unhappy. They look at their lives and there is no sin of commission that they can see. They have not told any lie. They have not committed any overt sin. Any sin they can lay their hands upon. And yet there is no peace. There is confusion. There is unrest. There is discouragement. There is depression. Distress in their hearts and oppression. They don't know why. 
is part of the peril of silent faith. Whenever something is like that, you should understand that the heavy hand of God upon the silent faith, if you'll go out immediately, because that means your, your debt of evangelism has accumulated to the point that God just cannot look upon you again. With any, there is no way for him to just continue to show favor that he has to withdraw his fellowship, his favor, his goodness, his kindness, that now all that confusion and darkness are set in. If you will understand the language of the Spirit, and immediately you will reach out and begin to evangelize, you will see that everything will come to normal. The depression will go, the unrest will vanish, and the heat and the pressure on your heart will vanish. And so that's why Jem, Jeremiah said, when I saw that, I could not stay again. Not only that, there is the removal from the kingdom of God. And this is serious. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. A man that has been called, and he answered the call with excitement at the beginning, but now he becomes silent. He doesn't preach anymore. He used to visit the railway stations to distribute tracts. He doesn't do it anymore. He used to tell those people in the taxi and the bus, hear the word of the Lord, ye must be born again. He doesn't do it anymore. He used to be in the open air, the street meeting, calling them, come to the Savior, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. He doesn't do it anymore. He used to knock on people's door in the community to tell them, I'm a messenger of the Lord, an ambassador of Christ. I have the message of life with me. I've come to tell you that Jesus came to die for you and he wants you to be born again. He used to do that knocking on doors. He doesn't do it anymore. He used to intercede and pray in the night for souls that souls will be saved. He doesn't do that anymore. He used to be touched with the, with the violence in the land, with the sins in the land. He used to pray with a prayer partner that God will bring a revival, a revival of repentance, a revival of conviction for sin, a revival of people turning, the, turning to the Lord and mass. He doesn't do that anymore. He used to wake up early in the morning with megaphone, preaching the gospel before people wake up in the morning. And his voice will be clear. And many people have come to the Lord like that. He doesn't do that anymore. He used to stand up in the bus. And while the people were jesting and mocking and rejecting what he was saying, he used to stand up and preach boldly the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one person or two people will come down to a, from the bus and follow after him and say, Tell me more. Tell me more. He used to see people that were on the verge of committing suicide and his message reached out to them and he had brought many, of pe many people like that to the gospel. He doesn't do it like that anymore. No man. Having put his son to the plow, you started, you are not finishing. You started, you have not completed the work and you have kept silent. No man. Having put his son to the plow and looking back, is feed for the kingdom of God. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Another peril, another danger is trouble and divine displeasure with no human remedy. Jonah chapter 1 from verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. This is going outside Israel. Jonah as a prophet had a ministry inside the nation, but he also had a ministry outside the nation. And now God called him that your ministry outside the nation is waiting for you. Your ministry to the laws, your ministry to the Gentiles, your ministry to the people outside the commonwealth of Israel is waiting for you. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord 
and went down to Joppa. And he found the sheep going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. What do you think of this when a loving God begins to fight against his own child, a redeemed soul? God who shows mercy. God who is gracious. God who has even put a lot of gifts and talents in the heart, in the life of the man. God who loves him so much that he has protected him till this time. When that God changes and turns at 180 degrees and he begins to fight against his own servant, the mighty God, the loving one, not showing any love at this time, any mercy at this time, any grace at this time, and he sends a tempest against Jonah. That's what God does. That's the danger the peril of silent saints. You know there are people that they know the call of God. They feel the call of God. And they feel that they can leave the work of God and go after business. They don't think that God has love as well as wrath and anger. They do not know that God can fellowship with a man. And if that man will turn around and spit on the face of God, that same God that fellowship with you before he can fight. And that God can fight so violently with the tempest, with the wind, with circumstances, with anything and everything. Jonah didn't know that if there was danger in silence, danger in forsaking the work of the Lord. He didn't want to go and fulfill his ministry outside. Now you understand if you've read about Jonah before. He had no problem with the ministry inside. His only problem was with the ministry outside. And some people think that God is happy with us. Once my ministry inside, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm doing my work inside. The two and a half hours or so in the church on Sunday, I'm doing my part. And the a few minutes that we need to give to the Lord, or the few hours on Saturday like this, I always come. And the few hours I need to give in the house fellowship, I'm doing my work, but that's inside. Jonah didn't have any problem with the ministry inside. His problem was with his ministry outside. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Well, we don't know what he considered, but we can just paint a picture. He had no friend there. Probably he had no accommodation there. He didn't know I would be protected over there. He had known about those people. They were sinful and violent. His life may not be secured outside there. Not only that Nineveh had been reputable, had been reputed for fighting against Israel. And those people were mighty against Israel. They were like enemies. And so Jonah thought about it. I would do double work if God wants me to do double work within the nation of Israel. If God wants me to give more time inside, I will do that. If he wants me to pray more inside, I will do that. He will, if he wants me to preach more inside, I will do that. But to Nineveh, outside, to go out and do that where there is no security, and where I cannot guarantee even the response of the people because the violence of the hand of Nineveh, nobody could predict them. He ran away. A tempest came. And that tempest was about to claim his life. There are believers today that all the troubles they were going through and they have prayed and fasted and the trouble is still there. If they will begin to evangelize, they won't need to pray so much anymore for that problem in particular. That problem will go. 
There are believers today that they can't understand what they call bad laws. And it is not bad laws. It's part of the peril and the danger of silent saints. Oh, they say, now, nowadays I don't know what's happening. When I was a younger Christian, I didn't have bad laws like this. But now I'm an older Christian, a lot of bad laws in my life. You know, when you were an older Christian, you took your ministry outside the church seriously. That's why those things were not there. But since now you have become silent like Jonah. Those things who are calling bad laws, they are not bad laws. They are signs of trouble and divine displeasure with no human remedy. You know, maybe you are so busy with your business of earning money that you have no time at all to witness for Christ during the week. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Are you so preoccupied with church office, church position, your ministry inside, to the point that now your ministry of reconciliation outside the church to the unsaved is neglected? Woe to the man who maintains a name in the visible church, but he has no recognition in the register of soul winners for Christ. It's your name in that register? And yet, if your name is not in that register, trouble can come any day. Unanswered prayer will be very many. The peril of silent saints will be very many. Before we pray, let's look at it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, and I must, I have nothing to glory of. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The Lord is saying, go and work in my vineyard. Call those people that are outside. Whatever is right, I will give you. A lot of reward waiting for you. Fellowship with the Lord waiting for you. The love of God will be broadened in your life. And a lot of prayers you have been praying and they have not been answered, they will begin to get answered immediately. You reach out for the ministry outside the church. The ministry of evangelizing. The ministry of getting the people that are still sinning to the Savior so that they will call upon the Lord and they will be saved. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let's rise up. Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen the peril yourself. You are from the scripture. Do not wait until the danger escalates in your life. Your ministry outside the church. To the unconverted, to the unsaved. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. The ministry inside the church is not a substitute for your ministry outside the church. Ministry of reconciliation. Personal evangelism. In Jesus' name we pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you very much because of this message. Lord, we thank you because of this timely warning that you are giving unto us. Having seen the way we started with you and the way this ministry started in personal evangelism, going out, not minding the the, not minding the rejection of people, but with a willing heart and loving heart, our Lord in heaven, we see that you are already slacking behind. We are seeing that you are already we are carrying big names and seeing probably that probably because many people are coming already, but because of your love, you are still telling us and reminding us how we started. Our Father in heaven, we are praying, Lord, that as our heart has been brought back unto you, we are praying, Lord, that this sort of bastardy will never repeat itself in our life in Jesus' name. Lord, as a church that has been built on personal evangelism and holiness, Lord in heaven, we are praying, Father, that we will not uh, be pulled off, lest you cast us off and start with other people, but that in humility, that we will be able to continue in personal evangelism, in loving you, 
and in loving the people in Jesus' name. Our God and our Father in our personal life, Lord, one way or the other, we have been exalted before you, holding church offices and having one name or the other. But Father in heaven, you still see us as your children. And as children, be obedient unto you, and that's why you are telling us all these things that you are hearing tonight. We are praying, Lord, that you keep our heart in a place of humility to obey. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my classmates. From I just thank God, third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in 